Let us pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts be an acceptable offering to you, our rock and our redeemer. If our gospel reading just now sounded familiar, it's probably because it's one that gets used at funerals a lot. And it's used because this passage comes directly at the beginning of Jesus' last dinner with his friends, with his followers. It's called the Farewell Discourse in John chapters 14, 15, and 16. It's, it's Jesus' last message. He knows what's coming, not only in terms of what's coming for him, but what's coming for his followers. And he wants to offer them some hope. Something to say that everything you're going to go through is going to be worth it. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be a long slog, but it's going to be worth it. It's to give the, his followers some peace and some hope. Now, as we've been reading through the book of Acts in this season of Easter so far, we've been hearing about that early church, that church in Jerusalem that's been held up kind of as the model church. This is what church life should be. And it's up till now been all pretty good stuff, right? Daily, they're growing. They started with, you know, 70 or so, then 3,000 joined, and then daily, the number was added to. Well, in the Acts reading that I'm going to share with you, things get a little messy. We start off at the end of a trial. A trial for a fellow by the name of Stephen. And it says, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Stephen has this vision at the end of a trial. He's been arrested for preaching this very weird message, preaching about this Jesus fellow that really we just want to put him away. And now he has this vision, this vision of, of Jesus who's standing up there at God's right hand. Oh, one of these days we'll get tech working. Now you would think, in, in the face of this inspired message, that the crowd might, might be happy, might be overjoyed. But if we go to the next slide, <laughs> put that away. We hear that the crowd put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him, they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. The people who are listening, they don't want to hear any of this. They don't, and they're going to make an example. The trial doesn't end in a conviction. The trial just ends. And Stephen is dragged out of the city. They throw stones at him. It's a lynching, pure and simple. They're done with him. And it's not a quick death. It's one that takes a while as stones are thrown at him. He's in pain. And we might expect that in the face of this, he's crying out for help. He's crying out for mercy. He's saying, please stop. I'll, 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 I'll not talk about this again. But what does he say? Well, on the next slide, we see as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Now those two bits that I have in bold there, 
If they kind of sound familiar, they should. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Sounds very much like, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. The last words of Jesus in Luke. And Lord, don't charge them with this sin. Is something that Jesus said earlier. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Not only is his final act a testament to his faith, but it's also a plea for pardon. He's just seen Jesus. He knows where he's going. He's ready to go, and he's ready to make a statement with this, his final breath. Not quite what we would expect. Now, texts like these are, are wonderful because they, they speak about the extent, the devotion that the early apostles had, those people who knew Jesus face to face, who had met him. It, it speaks volumes of the faith that he inspired. But they are a little alien to us. I don't think any of us have to worry about sharing Stephen's faith. But I think for many of us, it comes to us slightly more subtly when we stand in Stephen's shoes and we're tempted. I know in, in post-COVID times, we're not entirely sure. We know, we, we've officially heard this week that the pandemic is over. But are we really ready to return to exactly how everything was in early March of 2020? It's a question we wrestle with here in church. Are we ready to go back to a communion of intention? Or are we going to keep it the little reusable cups, or sorry, pre-sealed cups. It's something that we wonder in hospital visits. Prior to COVID, you, you could wander in, and unless someone was really unwell, you didn't need any protective gear. Now, once you're five feet within the door, you've got to get a mask on at least. And some people are even worried about how much can they socialize. There are still people who are isolated. People who are staying away. They're staying away from going out to restaurants, from going out to malls, from socializing with people that they don't know 100%. They're, they're worried about these things. It, it comes from this self-preservation instinct that we have, and we all have it. And I'm not here to knock self-preservation. It can, at times, be a good thing. Right? Maybe, maybe when there's a bear sitting in the middle of the parking lot, we shouldn't go charging out to chase it away. Or, or to make it more relatable, if there's a coyote out in the park, we don't go chase it away unless we need to, right? That self-preservation instinct that we, we don't want to get attacked by a wild animal. Or the self-preservation instinct that makes us slam on the brakes when someone's being a little crazy in front of us on the road. Overall, it's not a bad thing. It's quite useful. I think without a self-preservation instinct, we wouldn't have made it as far as we have. But, like anything else that we've got, it can be taken to overdrive. There's a shadow side to this self-preservation instinct that we have when it makes us insular, when it keeps us apart and isolated. Especially now in the wake of COVID, when it breaks down communities. And we are meant to live in community. We are meant to live side by side. Neuroscientists have found all sorts of useful neurotransmitters getting released into our brain whenever we're in community, whenever we're in group. Studies have been done that show that being isolated for too long is, is a really bad idea. It has detrimental effects on our mental health. And as an introvert, as an introvert, I wear that proudly. I can tell you, every once in a while, I gotta get out or I'm gonna go a little stir crazy. And I can see my wife nodding in the back there, so you know it's true. <laughs> but even theologically, in the very beginning, God said, let us make 
man in our image. Let us make humankind in our image. God already in community, the Trinity, the three in one, the one in three. That mysterious formulation that we have for God said, let us make humankind in our image. And even when we have turned away from God and we were convinced that we could do it our own way, God still came to Abraham and said, through you I will reconcile the world to me. And then we have Jesus, who came that we might know God, that we might have a living example of God walking in our midst, to say that we need that community. In our Acts reading today, Stephen sees Jesus, and he sees Jesus in community with God. Where is Jesus standing? It's not just that he sees the Son of Man. He sees the Son of Man at the right hand of God, in community with God. Stephen is entering into this threshold state, this liminal state, between life on earth and life in the kingdom of heaven. He knows what's coming, and that enables him to set aside his self-preservation for a moment and to make that final act. Now, liminal states, they're, they're useful, and they're great to help overcome these things like self-preservation when they're too strong. I, I think about when I learned to ride a bike. Now, the first time Dad put me at the top of the driveway, and it was a very steep driveway, it was a gravel driveway. And down I would go, like any kid learning to ride a bike, I fell. And scraped myself on the gravel. Well, a few times of that, I was kind of done with riding a bike. Until later on, it was a much shallower driveway. And I remember starting, not trying to get on the pedals and everything and go all at once, just walking the bike down. And then just trying to glide down, not even worry about getting my feet on the pedals, get my feet ready to hit the ground if I go too fast. Then get my foot on one pedal, and then get it on the other pedal, just little steps by step. Sometimes when families, when young couples, they want to have a child, but they're not 100% sure if they're ready for a child, what they might do is they'll get a pet. A pet that will be dependent on them, but they can, they can try and see, am I ready for a child? Are we ready to support a child? If we can take care of a dog or a cat, we can probably take care of a kid. If the dog or the cat is too much for us, maybe we're not ready for a kid yet. <laughs> sounds, sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds like sound reasoning. Get a fish, okay. Well, yeah, you can't take care of a fish. <laughs> Stephen's story here, it's not about how he died, it's about how he lived. How he lived seeing God in the everyday. And because he saw God in the everyday, he was able to step beyond himself. There are stories about Franciscan nuns, and they actually did some neural scans on them. They, they looked at their brains as they were praying, and they noticed that the prayers seemed to shut off all of those self parts of the brain, and they started thinking about how they were connected to everyone else. And this persisted even after they had stopped praying. When we find that balance between self-preservation and living in community, then we can set aside that need to preserve ourselves and use our gifts for the benefit of the community, for the benefit of others. And we live in a community where all of our gifts can be shared. And we all have gifts. I mean, I know my gifts tend to be being able to stand up here and speak relatively fearlessly. <laughs> but my gifts aren't in musical leadership. I need help there. And I'm blessed to have help from Colin and from the rest of the choir. 
And my gifts, as, as much as I see the value in our next generation, I know that I'm not the best when it comes to youth leadership. I, I have troubles being cool for the kids. But I am thankful and we are blessed that we have people who are able and willing to take that step and help lead the kids. And when it comes to building up community with community events, we are blessed with so many people who are willing to run the events. So many people who are willing to help out with these events. And I'm even thankful for the people who are willing to lead in financial leadership. Because looking at those numbers for too long and my head just kind of goes fuzzy, as I suspect many of our heads might go. But I'm so thankful that so many people come with gifts to share in community. And when we do share our gifts, when we set aside that self-preservation and we are able to reach out and share those gifts, then we're able to shape our lives around God's call. And we see evidence of that call being lived out that when we need, that need gets answered. Maybe not in the way that we're looking for, but it gets answered nonetheless. And we have faith that in my Father's house there are many mansions. And you know what I'm pulling from King James, I'm getting serious here. Mansions. Not just many rooms, but many mansions. Rich and abundant living is promised to us when we are in community, when we can set aside that self-preservation, and when we are able to enter into community, to admit where our weaknesses are, to live to our strengths. We have rich and abundant lives from living out our call in community, and when we do, then we really give it all for the gift of glory. Let me pray for you. God of Easter promise. We know that sometimes we seek after our own concerns and we ignore your call in our midst for community. But we give thanks for the promises made through Jesus. For the promises to be with us. For the promises that there is hope. Help us, God, to live in faith as a hope-filled Easter people who know that the resurrection is real who know that you are coming and you still come today and help us to share all of our very gifts in our community for the sake of your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.